This is uh, John Groves coming to you from my home studio. Today, for our Bible talk, I'd like to talk about Moses and the burning bush. Moses' Moses's life breaks down into three distinct stages. The first stage, which we touched on with respect to his birth, concerns his life as an Egyptian royal. It was a privileged existence that allowed him to develop in manifold ways. But after killing an Egyptian overseer who was abusing a Hebrew slave, he feared being discovered and escaped to the land of Midian. There he met up with Jethro's daughters, assisted them in watering their flocks, and eventually became part of Jethro's extended family. As a semi-nomadic herder, Moses is called out by God from what we commonly refer to as the burning bush. More specifically, the bush is described in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, as blazing, yet it was not consumed. The final stage of Moses' life and career concerns his return to Egypt, the liberation of the Hebrew slaves, and leading the Israelite nation to the promised land. The burning bush episode is said to have taken place at the foot of Mount Horeb. While we cannot identify precisely where this mountain is located, there is a near consensus among scholars that Mount Horeb is the same mountain as Mount Sinai, where tradition holds Moses received the Ten Commandments. Moses was curious about the appearance of a bush on fire and yet not consumed. A raging fire would readily destroy a bush and leave behind only ashes. Here, the situation was different. A voice from the bush called out Moses' name and instructed him to remove his sandals since the ground was holy and not to come any closer. The ensuing dialogue reveals that God has a mission for Moses. He is to deliver the Israelites, his people, from the oppression of the Egyptians. Moses is naturally apprehensive about taking on this role and essentially asks God how he is to carry out this mission. What is your name? Who shall I say sent me? And how will I be able to persuade Pharaoh to let the Israelites go? God instructs Moses to take up a staff that can magically become a snake and is give, he is given other superpowers, you might say, to emphasize his demands. This is the moment where, where God reveals that he, she, or it is the I am. Tell Pharaoh and the Egyptians that I am has sent you. One other objection Moses raises in his litany is that he is slow of tongue and simply not an orator. God tells Moses that Aaron, Moses' brother, will serve as his spokesman. Many have interpreted this objection as suggesting that Moses may have been a stutterer. I am more inclined to interpret this limitation as one that is all too common as we transcend national borders. The affliction is simply speaking the language with a foreign accent. Keep in mind, that Moses grew up in a royal Egyptian court. And while he may well have learned to speak Hebrew, he very likely would have spoken the language with an Egyptian accent. His authority to lead the Israelites might well be impaired if by not sounding like them, he is regarded as a foreign usurper. A politician in Missouri, for example, has to emphasize that he is from Missouri, for example, as I heard former Senator Stuart Symington affirm in one of his public speeches. Symington was born in Massachusetts and was raised in Baltimore before moving to Missouri as one of President Truman's key leaders. I think it is fundamentally unfair to judge others by the nuances of their speaking habits and the presence of foreign accents but it is endemic to our nature to judge whether a speaker is one of us by whether he speaks and sounds like we do. 
Think about this the next time you encounter a person speaking with a foreign accent. Is that person less educated, less polished? Not one of us. We can be very surprised to discover that a person who speaks with an accent nevertheless retains a wealth of experience and culture from which we can learn quite a few things. And consider also how we might come across in other parts of the world if all we can do is speak our region's English. Now, I'd like to take a moment to share with you a mural from the third century common era depicting our biblical scene. This mural was discovered in the 1930s during an archeological excavation in Syria, not far from the Euphrates River. The city of Dura Uropos was located on a bluff above the river. And after it was abandoned on or about third, the third century, it was not rebuilt as so many other cities of antiquity were. When it was rediscovered, it proved to be an archeologist's haven. This mural is from a Jewish synagogue. It was part of a series of murals depicting Jewish history. The mural now resides at a museum in Damascus. Please note how the mural is structured. On the left side, we have the bush, shown as if it were a stalk of corn with its long and pointed green leaves suffused with the red lines that suggest the bush is ablaze without being consumed. Moses is clothed in what appears to be Roman garb. And in between the bush and Moses is a pair of sandals that Moses has removed from his feet. On the upper left hand corner, we see a hand outstretched. In Exodus chapter 3 verse 20, we read, So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders that I will perform in it. After that, he, referring to Pharaoh, will let you go. The outstretched hand as a figure of speech occurs frequently in Hebrew scripture. The mighty and outstretched hand of God performs many wonders to behold. In our mural, the unknown artist has made use of this concept in his depiction of the burning bush. The technical term to use to describe the burning bush and other unusual reported divine manifestations is theophany. This term comes from two Greek words. Theos means God or divinity, and the suffix is derived from the Greek verb phinomai, from which we have the term phenomena, referring to events or appearances that occur before us. The Bible makes extensive use of a variety of theophanies to describe how God interacts with different leaders. However we envision the burning bush, we can appreciate Charles Fillmore's metaphysical definition in his book, The Revealing Word. He considers the experienced a balanced state of mind where the light of intuition or flame burns in our hearts and yet is not consumed. He goes so far as to state that it represents a vibrational process in the brain that uses up the wisdom that comes from the heart. He regards this wisdom as holy ground or substance in its spiritual wholeness. Here he identifies divine mind. Until next time, when we will explore another chapter in the life of Moses, this is John Groves signing off.